this is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today... College football is back on covering the spread. We are talking week number one with Ben Stevens of Sports Grid, Sports Grid getting his thoughts on the big games this weekend and his overall process for betting in week number one. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. Ed, week one. Come out up hot for college football, week zero in the books. You had Bet Bash last week, so a very busy time of year. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. I'm really looking forward to so many of these uh, college football games this weekend. We'll talk about some of them today, but there's some other uh, there's some other awesome Big Ten games too, Indiana at Iowa, and uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, I do end up going to Bet Bash last week. Uh, it was uh, it was on Wednesday, and you always take a little bit of a risk scheduling a plane flight for earlier in the day of an event you hopefully want to get to at 7 p.m. Yeah. So I was supposed to leave at about noon, and my flight gets delayed. And you know, first it's like delayed till four. It's like, oh, it stinks, but you know, at least I'll be there. And then it gets delayed till 8 p.m. So that you know that makes you think about whether you actually want to go when you're literally was you were supposed to be there for 36 hours and. Right. Now you're going to show up at 11 p.m. for an event that is technically over. Hemmed up about a little bit, but I ended up going. So it was uh, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was good to see a lot of people. Spanky did a great job um, hosting the whole thing. It actually was quite a challenge to get up to the actual event because it was they were trying to close it down, so they were trying to bring people downstairs to the bar, and I was trying to go up and had to beg my way in there. But once once the guy found Spanky, he's like, yeah, yeah, he's he's with us. So. So that was that was pretty nice. But, you know, it's amazing how he just has an idea and then he makes it happen. And there was a ton of people at this event and they have already announced the next Bet Bash uh, Final Four weekend in Las Vegas. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, it was a great it was a great time to network and uh, there will there'll be more opportunities in the future. That's awesome. Um, and I feel like it's probably the first time you've seen a lot of those people since probably Sloan in 2020, if I had to guess. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and yeah, this time I came back and I didn't have COVID. So <laughs> it's, uh, even better that way. Well, that's awesome. But, Glad you got to get, go out there. I know again, obviously plans changed and couldn't quite, uh, you know, do it in the way you plan, but still good to like get out there, see people you've not seen in a while. And also just like talk betting before yep. what I think is the most exciting month of betting, mostly because I'm not a big, like, you know, March Madness guy and stuff like that. To me, September is awesome. We get overlap of NFL, baseball, NASCAR, golf. It's a very busy time for me, but also yeah. it's pretty fun. So good to get the, the the wheels flowing there heading into this month. Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of an overwhelming time. And I've yeah. taken two trips in the last two weeks. And I'm not going to do that again in August. Uh, there's a lot of things going on with the site and everything. I actually just filed my last... Uh, episode for uh the preview oh, nice. series on the football analytics show so luckily that got done today but there's still a bunch of things that that need to happen on the site so it's a hard time to travel to but um yeah maybe next year just one trip yeah i had uh we had a wedding in july we had our own wedding reception in august we had uh fanduel fan fest in denver in yeah, august great. we have a wedding this weekend in maryland so I am ready to never leave the house again, which is a very dangerous thing to say given the past year and a half. But like, you know, I'd welcome some weeks shut in home at this point because it's been a wild past month. And while we're, we're locked in home, we can watch some college football. We're going to get you set for this weekend's games by talking to Ben Stevens. You can find him on Twitter at Ben Scott Stevens. He is, of course, of course the co-host of The Morning After on Sports Grid. We had Ariel Epstein on a couple months ago to talk NBA prop betting. She is a co-host with Ben over at uh, The Morning After. Really fun duo to talk to. I'm on their show every, every Friday to talk some NASCAR and some NFL and some baseball stuff. We're going to talk with Ben about week one of college football. And he is a big, big 10 guy. So we're going to talk to Ben about the origins of that, why he loves the big 10, and also get his thoughts on Penn State versus Wisconsin, which is coming up this week. If you want some more NFL talk, though, we do have 
Four different NFL Futures podcasts already recorded. We had one with J.J. Zacharyson on player props. Aaron Dolan talked divisional outrights. Edward Egros came on to, sw- to talk about win totals. And then Nick Costas last week talked Super Bowl 56 Futures. You can find all those shows by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, you name it. You can find us there. And while you're there, leave us a rating and review as well. We also had Drew Martin on talk some uh, futures bets for college football, and we'll see and get a lot more information on those coming up this week. So Ben is coming up in just one second. But first, hey, sports fans, FanDuel is offering an exclusive promotion for new sportsbook users. Join FanDuel Sportsbook today. Make your first bet. If you lose, we'll give you a refund up to $1,000 in site credit within 72 hours. Your first bet after after depositing will qualify. If you have multiple selections on one bet slip, it will be the first selection you made. Head over to FanDuel Sportsbook today and place your first bet. Must be 21 plus and present in Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. New users only. Max refund $1,000 site credit. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Colorado, 1-800-522-4700. In Iowa, 1-800-BETS-OFF. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call or text the red line at 1-800-889-979. Or in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Covering the present. Let's bring Ben Stevens into covering the spread to talk a little bit of college football with week number one coming up, actually starting tonight uh, with a couple of games going on. So the action is already here. Ben, we made it. How are you doing today? Jim, I am doing very well. Ed, a pleasure to meet you. I am very glad to be here on Covering the Spread, talking all things college football. It is my favorite sport. It has been my favorite sport since I first saw Lee Corso put on headgear on college game day since I was eight years old. I wasn't handicapping at the age of eight, but here I am ready for the 2021 college football season, and I cannot wait. The week one slate is just filled with marquee matchups. It's a masterpiece. Hard eye emojis, everything you could say. I'm very excited to be here. It really is uh, a great slate of games. And we're going to talk about three of the bigger games here. We'll get some Big Ten discussion in there. And the reason why I got to get some Big Ten in there is because you're a big, Big Ten guy, Ben. And I'm very curious because I knew that you went to Syracuse. I had been talking to Ariel and I was like, okay, cool. Syracuse guy, you know, probably skewing towards the East Coast. And then I saw you tweet about Ryan Field and it threw me off. I was like, what is this guy doing who knows of Ryan Field on the East Coast? I was very confused. So where does this Big Ten fascination come from? Where did it re- originate? All right. So I will explain the origin going back to his very core of Big Ten Ben, who I have been coined in a persona that I still feel very <laughs> near and dear in my heart. So you are right. I went to Syracuse University, a proud alum, go orange all the way. But I don't necessarily have the greatest tie to the ACC. I could care less what Georgia Tech and Wake Forest do. So when I started my professional broadcast career, I was working as a sports anchor and reporter out at the CBS affiliate in Omaha, Nebraska, covering all things Huskers. And as you guys know, that entire state from as far east as Omaha to as far west as the Colorado border, nothing is more important than Saturdays in the fall in Lincoln, Nebraska. So I fell in love and was in doctrine with the Big Ten really through the lens of Nebraska. And then as I left Omaha and was doing some things around the podcasting space, I got involved with a Big Ten podcast that led to another Big Ten podcast that really kind of led me into building the brand of Big Ten Ben. So that's why you can see the flags over my left shoulder here. And that is really where my affinity for the Big Ten Conference comes. Uh, I think that's we're... Next... Go ahead, Ed. I think that's excellent, Ben, because it's really hard covering 130 college football teams, at least for me, uh, also having delved into the NFL more over recent years. Does this impact your betting, too? Are you more likely to bet Big Ten games, even though kind of the consensus would be those lines might be sharper? Certainly so. I'm a huge college football fan and have a pretty good knowledge, I would like to say, of the sport in general, but I can go deeper into the Big Ten, so my handicapping, I feel, is a little bit more expertise level when it comes to the Big Ten. That is to say, though, to start off the 2020 Big Ten football season, I started infamously 0-10-1 against the spread. Some would say that's even more <laughs> impressive than 10-0-1, but who am I to argue with those very smart people? So yes, my handicapping for the Big Ten can go a little bit deeper. I might know more of the depth chart breakdown. I might know more of the history of these football programs when it comes to the Big Ten Conference. But overall, I would like to think, at least I hope I can, give a little bit of expertise across all of college football. For sure. So uh, when when were you in Omaha, out of curiosity? Like, uh, 
What, yeah, what, I, what were the years for this? I graduated Syracuse in May 2016. A couple ah. months later, I started off in Omaha in August 2016. Okay. I was there for two years through my contract through August 2018. And then that's when I moved to New York City, was working through a variety of other jobs, and then got going with Sports Grid really this past March. And it was kind of yeah. around Big Ten basketball into the conference tournaments, into then the NCAA tournament for March Madness, of course. And so, my roots are in college sports. I love all sports. I've been a huge sports fan across you know the entirety of my life. But really, I think my foundation is more in college sports. And I don't mind being called the college sports guy. So it's good by me. Sure. Well, I was hoping you, so you would have been there in 2013 because that's the one time I was in Lincoln was 2013, Nebraska Northwestern, the Battle of the NUs. And mm. the Jordan Westerkamp Hail Mary game was, yeah. or was that the year before? Either way, it was 2013 or 2012. And that was the Jordan Westerkamp, Ron Kellogg, Hail Mary game. Oh. And I remember walking out of the stadium and like all these Nebraska fans, because we were flying with the team through their radio. And like, they were like saying to the, the players, we hope you all have a great rest of the year. And it was like, so like rattling for me to hear like opposing fans wishing the players like the best, but like, I know people like I'm from Minnesota and people say like Minnesota nice is a thing, but I feel like right. it's actually more Nebraska nice. I, I think that they actually take the cake in that regard. That is their state motto, Jim. You will not hear more opes in your life. Oh, yep. excuse me, than walking around Memorial Stadium in Lincoln, Nebraska. This is how long Jordan Westerkamp played at the University of Nebraska. <laughs> because when I got there in August of 2016, he was going into his sixth year of eligibility. Him and Tommy Armstrong were still the staples of a Mike Riley pro offense. So that's how long Jordan Westerkamp played in Lincoln. Okay, so we at least got that overlap. That's good. All right, Ben. So while we got you on the the topic of Nebraska, um, so my numbers really like them on the road against Illinois. I couldn't talk myself into betting it. Happy I came with that conclusion. Give us the state of the state of Nebraska. It can't be good right now. Oh, Ed, it is worse than good. I mean, it is worse than bad. It is worse than misery. It is going as far down as you can go. I was in Omaha covering Scott Frost's introductory pest conference when he was hired from UCF. The prodigal right. son returned home to Lincoln, who led the Cornhuskers to their last national championship in 1997. I said on the airwaves that day, and I still stand by this, that if Scott Frost is not the guy to bring Nebraska back to the glory days, then I don't know who does it. And that's kind of right. how I feel now. But the grace period has certainly worn off. It had worn off entering last Saturday's game against the Illini and now feels very dismal for a team that made the same exact mistakes, Ed. We have seen them make Make over the three years of Scott Frost's tenure. It was terrible. I mean, really, yeah. you could not have drawn up a worse game for the Huskers. Penalties that cost them every opportunity. Adrian Martinez in his fourth year with the same offensive mind of Scott Frost looking very uncomfortable, very fast feet. Nothing made sense. I had Nebraska minus six and a half as a bet that I loved because I said, Scott Frost needs to continue his time in Lincoln. And if he needs to do that, he needs to at least push their team win total of six. One of those six games, not if, maybe, hopefully so, must be the win over Illinois. Now I don't really know how they get to six, how they become bowl eligible. It is as bad as it could possibly be in Lincoln, Nebraska right now, Ed. And I feel for all of Husker Nation that I really love during my time there. And I know they're going through it at the moment. Yeah, no, it, it was certainly painful and you know, mistakes are mistakes, and I understand those add up for the program, but Adrian Martinez simply was not accurate with the football. And I did an episode a couple years ago talking about Mario Verduzco and his brilliance as a quarterback coach, and that was heading into 2019 and his sophomore campaign. And I don't know. I just don't know what, what has happened to that guy, right? I mean, if you tell me that Adrian Martinez plays, I will bet Nebraska minus seven in that game all day. Sorry yeah, if he plays well. And, yeah, no. uh, but I, you know, there, there's just been, he was a lot, he was better as a freshman all oh. around running, throwing everything. Right. So by far it was his best 2018, his freshman year on campus in Lincoln was by far the best of his collegiate career. And it led to Heisman conversation heading yeah. into 2019. He was the dark horse that people were saying he might be a Heisman contender when all is said and done now in year two under Scott Frost, look out for this Nebraska team. Yeah, That was not certainly the case. And Adrian Martinez has regressed every year. There was one bright spot in a weird 2020 season last year in Big Ten football for the Cornhuskers and Adrian Martinez specifically. And that was his highest completion percentage during his collegiate career at over 70%. And so you thought, okay, that's a ground thing that we can build off of now. In fact, it was the complete opposite on Saturday against the Illini, missing yeah. easy, easy throws. And there at the final drive of the game, you saw 
really the exposure of Adrian Martinez's game, and that's downfield passing. I mean, he wasn't close to anything nope. he needed to be through the final minute of that game. I mean, there was a lot of pressure. Obviously, Illinois was up by eight at that time. They were playing prevent defense at all times, but it was ugly. Like, really, there's no other word to use except it was very difficult to watch. Yeah. So let's talk about a happier subject and talk about week one uh, and leave Nebraska in the past for right now. I'm sure we'll <laughs> talk about them again uh, later on this year. But let's talk about your process heading into week one, because there's a lot that goes on year over year for college football. You got to look at depth charts, which you talked about when, you know, why you skew towards the Big Ten. But like, what do you lean on when trying to research for week one specifically when we don't have data on these teams yet in this year? Looking at recruiting rankings, what are you looking at here to try to decide how you want to view these teams entering week one? Yeah, so recruiting rankings, I think, are very beneficial if you have some impact freshmen that will come in right away or younger guys that might have saw a little bit of experience the season prior and now from the 2019 class or the 2020 class are supposed to take that next step entering their sophomore year on campus. But what I first and foremost look at is sample size. And last year, it's more difficult to, than ever to do from 2020 going into 2021 because of the variety of games we had, not just across the country from SEC to Big Ten, but within the Big Ten alone, there were teams in the Big Ten Conference that played six games. There were teams that played nine games. How healthy were these teams in that COVID year? And can you really gain any bit of significance from what you saw last year? So I think when you have entering 2021, a sample size of around seven to eight games, you can take actual meaningful statistics from that. And one of the things, Jim, that I think is most important and a caveat to know for this year normally in a college football season as that turnover goes from summer workouts into fall camp the number one storyline for any program is what is your returning level of production how many upperclassmen do you have back due to the COVID eligibility year that is something that is across the nation this year that people will highlight 75 percent of their production is back 85 percent of their production <laughs> it is not as much of a distinguishing factor entering week one this year as it has been in years prior because you will see really across the board, if teams have less than like 17 starters coming back, <laughs> something didn't work out. Something was weird. The transfer portal was hit hard. The NFL draft was just a bevy of options for this specific program. So that is something that I think you might hear and you might read that, okay, Minnesota has all five of their offensive linemen returning for this year, or Miami returns everybody in front of De'Ara King. That's great, but so do about 75% of the country. So it's not as much of an edge in your handicap as it has been in years past. Yeah, absolutely. And like Notre Dame is one of those teams that has not a lot of returning production back. They're kind of the outlier. Uh, maybe wouldn't be in a different year. But um, but yeah, let's let's keep talking, Ben, about kind of week one. Um, how, are, how are you going about this? Do you feel like you're going to be betting more this week? Or are you kind of waiting to see some of these players uh, get on the field before you start firing away? Well, I think, Ed, one of the biggest things about week one, and this goes for any casual college football better, is to blend the excitement with actual edges, making sure you have an understanding of what you are betting on. There is a bevy of options for you. It is a buffet. Tonight alone, I believe this comes out on Thursday, there are 14 games that kick off in a 90-minute span. You might be seeing things fly across your screen, and you're like, oh, I need to bet on this one. I need to bet on this one. Do not do that. Make sure you do your time to do your research and where you feel you might have a lean or an edge. Sure. Go into this game. Also maybe go in with a smaller unit than you might moving forward, because even if you feel like you have a great lean and you know, a depth chart is coming back and you know that the same offensive system is in place for a quarterback who's been under center for two years. And this is going to be that big distinguishing edge that you have for your handicap. You still don't necessarily know what this team is going to look like specifically in the year 2021. Yes, we have a lot more reliability this year than we did last offseason. We had full winter conditioning. We had full spring practice, summer workouts, fall camp. All of that is certainly something that leads to a little bit more sustainability year over year. But it's still week one. You're not entirely sure what you're going to see from these offenses and defenses. Is it going to be a slower start? Will this defense take the next step? So maybe a smaller unit play in some of your bankroll management as you get going in this beginning of the college football season. Well, I think that's smart too, because then you can allow yourself to have the fun of week one and getting back yeah. into it without overextending yourself. So it's a nice balance because we do bet for fun too. It's, you know, it's, it is, we're trying to profit, but like, you know, sometimes we're trying to have some fun and that is right. a good way to get around that is by reducing the unit size. So we got big 10 Ben here. Let's talk about one of the bigger big 10 games this week. Penn state at Wisconsin, Wisconsin, five and a half point favorite total here is 49 and a half. And we talked about Penn State a lot on the show over the past couple of years, specifically because of things like recruiting rankings. They get a lot of good recruits 
the problem has always been the quarterback position, and they haven't figured that one spot out. If they can figure that out, this team has a lot of upside. So what do you think about Sean Clifford heading into 2021? Ooh, okay, so Jim, a lot of people are going to tell you Sean Clifford is going to take that next step. He's going to be a guy <laughs> in this offensive system under Mike Yurcich. I don't believe it. I'm sorry. I don't. Sean Clifford is a guy that I think has a certain level of limitation in what he can do at the quarterbacking position. Everybody saw what he did in 2019 and thought the ceiling for this guy was going to be one of the best quarterbacks in the Big Ten Conference. But his completion percentage has been below 60% the entirety of his time in Happy Valley. He's not a consistent quarterback. He utilizes his legs well, and he can make up for some of those disadvantages. But he wasn't even really supposed to be the guy. Don't forget, after Trace McSorley, it was going to be Tommy Stevens. Tommy Stevens ended up transferring, and then it was like, oh, okay, we got Sean here. Sean, let's uh, see what you can do out there. And I think there's a certain level of limitation to what Sean Clifford can do. Also, something to know about new offensive coordinator Mike Yursich, his system is more designed for a pro-style quarterback. Sean Clifford is the definition of a dual-threat quarterback. He's ranked in the top three in quarterback rushing yards the past two years in the Big Ten Conference. And yes, having him back as a starter for his third year on campus is huge from that sustainability standpoint. But it's a new offensive system once again. He had a new offensive system last year heading into 2020 under Kurt Chiroka, who came over from Minnesota. So I don't necessarily believe in Sean Clifford like some other people might. He has a wonderful weapons at his disposal. Jahan Dotson is one of the best wide receivers in the Big Ten Conference. The backfield for Penn State this year is going to be incredibly deep with Kevon Lee, Noah Kane coming back from injury, Devin Ford, who's a very high recruit. They have a lot of pieces to maybe make up for some of the disadvantages of Sean Clifford. But if I'm banking all of my thought into Penn State having a bounce back year, being a 9-10 win team that can compete with Ohio State, the Big Ten East, on Sean Clifford, you're going to go broke pretty quickly. Okay, so they're five and a half point dogs here against Wisconsin. Do you think they can cover that? Or are the concerns around Clifford enough to keep you away from Penn State plus five and a half? I think they are because Wisconsin's defense is going to be very good this year. Jim Leonard, the defensive coordinator in Madison, passed up other opportunities to possibly go to the NFL level or other places across college football. They bring back so many guys defensively. And again, I'm saying that in a way of not using it as a distinguishing edge, but just knowing a little bit more of what you can expect out of this Wisconsin defense. They have a safety linebacker hybrid guy in the name of Nick Herbig, who's going into his sophomore year on campus in Madison. He is incredible. He is a playmaker at every level. And if Sean Clifford is inconsistent come Saturday, Nick Herbig might be the recipient of some badly thrown balls from Sean Clifford. And then obviously offensively, you know what you're going to get with Wisconsin. Run the damn ball. And Paul Chris <laughs> certainly believes in that. And now they have Graham Mertz going into his second year. And he has so many weapons at his disposal as well. You know the offensive line, the hog mollies up front for Wisconsin are going to be great. Ches Malusi is the Clemson transfer. He was actually named the starter earlier this week on depth chart day on Monday, which was a little bit interesting seeing as Jalen Berger, the freshman from last year, was incredibly talented for Wisconsin as well. So they really have a two-headed monster in the backfield for a Wisconsin team that is going to run the ball down your throat each and every time. And Penn State defensively, their linebacking core is going to be good. My question is around that front four on the D-line, and I think Wisconsin has a huge edge there in this game. So although five and a half is maybe a little bit of a bigger number than I would have hoped, if you really want to bank everything on Wisconsin, I still think they can win this game by a touchdown. So yes, I lean the Badgers on Saturday. Yeah, that's interesting. I I, I agree. Like, um, I, I, I ended up not betting this game. I think it's a pretty fair number. My numbers actually like Penn State a little bit. I think they, they have them by about four. Um, but I, I also believe that Wisconsin has the better quarterback and the better defense, and they're at home. So five and a half seems like a, a pretty solid number. But, Ben, I did want to ask you, who outside of State College thinks that Sean Clifford's going to make that leap? I, you know, that's what they bank on though. Ed. That's what they say. They say year number three, same quarterback on campus under James Franklin. He's going to do it this year. At least that's what I've heard from certain people and why Penn state is a top 20 team that is going to rival Ohio state in the big 10 East. They circle Sean Clifford, but he's also their biggest question mark. So I guess he's more of their liability. If he is good this year, sure. Penn state is going to have the talent across their roster to be a good football team. And I certainly think Penn State can win nine games this year. I'm not taking that away from them, but I've heard that about Sean Clifford, that if he does take that step, watch out for the Nittany Lions. I just Oh, yeah, that if that he does take that it. step. Right. If he works exactly. himself into, uh, you know, in an NFL draft pick, yeah, of course, they'll be they'll, they'll <laughs> challenge Ohio State for sure. Yeah. Uh, I actually just did my uh, Big Ten preview and uh, I was looking back and, and passing success rate. They've been 40th and 32nd over the last two seasons with Clifford. So mm. fine, but 
again, not the type of offense that I, that I think is really going to, you know, and I think this is a top 10 team, right? Like, again, you're going to win nine, maybe 10 games, but can you, can you challenge the big dog in Ohio state? Probably not with Clifford. Right. And I would agree with that statement very much. I think that if you want to win nine games, you want to win 10 games, Penn state does have that capability. Can they knock off Ohio state? I don't think so. I don't think they can get to a Big Ten championship game based on what Sean Clifford has and really some of the other gaps on this defense. And I think up front for Penn State, they hit the transfer portal hard, but they've lost so much talent along that defensive line in the last two years with guys like Yitro Gross Matos, of course, this past year, and Odafe Owe and Shaka Tony. Micah Parsons opted out last year. There needs to be some replacements on that defensive side for Penn State. So I think they have a cap this year. It's a good cap. It's nine or ten wins. It's just mm-hmm. not a bid to the Big Ten championship game and possibly a college football playoff outside shot. Yep. So let's talk about a couple neutral side site games coming up on this weekend. First one, Alabama versus Miami. Alabama, 19 and a half point favorite. Total here is 61 and a half. And Bryce Young, shockingly, named the starter for Alabama entering the season opener. What's your outlook for Bryce Young in, in an offense with a, a bunch of turnover, but still obviously a ton of talent uh, coming into this year? Jim, I don't think it matters what my outlook is. The guy's making seven figures. He yeah, who care cares? Have to He's fine. <laughs> He's good, man. It's all good. I mean, here's the thing about Alabama. The reigning national champions, the preseason number one, and that makes sense. But I do think there are more talented teams this year than Alabama. And I know that we have a lot of stake in Bryce Young. He was a guy that was going to rival Mac Jones last year and possibly push Mac out of a starting job if things did not work out for Mac Jones. Of course, we know that was not the case. And Mac Jones was very good and continues to be very good even at the next level. But there are so many changing pieces on this Alabama offense. They do not return as much up front offensively as some other teams might across that offensive line. When you think about guys like Landon Dickerson, that was the anchor of that team that have left to the NFL. Obviously on the outside, you lose Devontae Smith, you lose Jalen model sure you still have John Mechie and the playmakers are going to be great but you lose Najee Harris as well you lose your quarterback in Mac Jones and I think most importantly you lose Steve Sarkeesian let's not forget and this is nothing away from Nick Saban Alabama was a great team before the likes of Sark and Lane Kiffin came to Tuscaloosa but they were not a high scoring team they ranked second in the country in points per game last year and 48.5 points per game for the Alabama Crimson Tide Steve Sarkeesian reinvented that offense and he had a lot of pieces to use and paint the picture that he wanted to. But I think without Sark this year and now Bill O'Brien, they'll still be able to have some success because they are just so deep and the athletes are incredible. And I expect Bryce Young to be very good, but there's a little bit more question marks I have about Bryce Young in that quarterback position than I think you could feel last year heading in, even with Mac Jones in place, knowing that Steve Sarkeesian as your offensive coordinator was there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Any thoughts on the Miami team and whether whether you have an opinion on the side at 19 and a half or, or the total? So I think this is a very, very intriguing game because Miami is a very trendy underdog pick. A lot of people look at Miami and they say, De'Ara King back. I know he's coming off the torn ACL, but he's a Heisman candidate in Rhett Lashley's offense. What they can do together, they are going to put up points. And they have so much returning under Manny Diaz on the other side for the defensive side of the ball for the Canes that Miami is one of the favorites to win the ACC Coastal, right along with North Carolina, a team that people think will play Clemson in the ACC title game. I'm a little bit more hesitant on this Miami team based on the fact that De'Ara King, who utilizes his legs to the best of his ability and which makes him that dynamic at the quarterback position, is coming off a torn ACL. So it's not doubting that he can be back at that level. It's just, let me see it first against an Alabama defense that is going to be even better than they were the past two years back now. And they led the SEC in total defense last year, and they got better heading into this season that I need to see it first for De'Ara King. And then you have the stats of Nick Saban in openers during his time at Alabama. He is 14 and 0 in week 1 games during his time at Alabama, 12 and 2 against the spread by an average margin of about 29 and a half points per game. That victory margin for Nick Saban. So, you correlate that to what we are seeing right now with a 19 and a half point spread. Although I think this game could be competitive, I think Alabama could win 45 to 21 and we wouldn't bat an eye. And that would just be a decent football game where Alabama truly showed their luster and pulled away. So if I'm looking at it from a side perspective, I would probably lean Alabama. When you're looking at the total, I think Miami can score enough, even against a really good defensive side, to maybe get over that total of 61 and a half. But I still think Alabama can win and cover this game. I th- certainly think Alabama wins. I do believe they can also cover. Okay. Awesome. So, so liking the total move. for that game. Go ahead, Ed. Oh, I was going to move on. So if you had something else. No, do it. uh awesome so let's go to the other huge game uh georgia at clemson at a neutral site uh i think clemson's back at 
uh, three and a half point favorite. Really, uh, probably the most difficult game Clemson plays for a while, at least until the ACC championship game. Uh, Georgia has finally uh, figured out that they should start JT Daniels at the quarterback position. Clemson's breaking in a new quarterback. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this game? I think it is an incredibly intriguing number. It has been the same number pretty much all offseason long from when this line opened up for week number one between Georgia and Clemson. And I have been on record as saying, I think you are getting Georgia in a better spot past that key number of three. And I know key numbers do not mean nearly as much for college football. But when it's Georgia and Clemson in a top five tilt, I think key numbers relate a little bit more to college football like they would on an NFL level. My concern about Georgia is the fact of all the injuries that they have heading into this game, especially on the outside and the t- pieces that JT Daniels needs to be successful. I think Zamir White is one of the best running backs in the country, so having him there is great, but we're not exactly sure what's going to be happening with George Pickens. I don't think we can expect him to be back oh, for this game. Yeah, Eric Gilbert is some weird things around the LSU transfer. Is he going to play? Two of the other three receding, uh, leading receivers from last year for Georgia should play in this opener against Clemson. So I think that is a little bit of reliability for JT Daniels. And then defensively, the edge really, I think still goes to Georgia, despite how good Brent Venables has this Clemson defense looking like for this year. Brian Bassey up front is going to be an absolute monster all year long. He is going to give ACC teams nightmares throughout the year. Andrew Booth Jr. in the secondary for Clemson is great. I don't like James Skalski because he hit Justin Fields in the way he did last year in the Sugar Bowl. But yes, having that back as the anchor of your defense, that's understandable as well. I think, guys, honestly, this is the year that I would pick Georgia if there were any time. I have said that I think Georgia can rival Alabama in the SEC, and that SEC championship game might go in the favor of the dog. So I think that you're getting points with Georgia right now past that field goal number. I like the dogs in this game. It's going to be tight. It is going to be competitive. I think Georgia can win outright, but I'm not going to pick them on the money line. I like the fact they're getting three and a half. I think the hook could be very beneficial come Saturday night. How long has James Skalski been at Clemson? Is he like the new Hunter Renfro here? Yeah. Oh, he, he was, he's been there for a while. Actually, I know for a fact this is his sixth year. I know okay. that for a fact, but it feels like he has been there, Jim, since Jordan Westerkamp made the Hail Mary catch against Northwest. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the new so, Hunter Renfro of Clemson, yes. Yeah, Ben, when I was out in Circa a couple weeks ago in Vegas, they had this at three. I think it got to three, maybe at FanDuel, um, but it's back to three and a half. So, you know, someone bet this pretty big at Circa. Uh, yeah. For the dogs, they said, forget the injuries. We think Georgia can get it done. Um, so, yeah, some, someone out there definitely agrees with with that opinion, uh, with your opinion on this game. I hope so. I think I feel very confidently in Georgia this year. I know the entire idea of Kirby Smart against Nick Saban, and Nick Saban's never lost to an assistant, and I get all that. But if there was going to be a year, and you just look on paper right now and what Georgia returns and what they have and what the expectation level in Athens is, I think Georgia – if you were going to re-rank the poll based on what we are going to see out of these teams this year, I think Georgia has as much of a stake for uh, for being the number one team in the country as does Alabama. So I think Georgia can be up there this year. I don't think this is a make or break game for the college football playoff really for either team, because if Clemson right, does sure. lose, they're going to run through the ACC and you're not going to keep a one loss Clemson team. That's an ACC champion out of the college football playoff, unless four other teams are unbeaten. And even if Georgia loses this game, if they were going to go on and beat Alabama in the SEC championship game, they have everything ahead of them. If they're a one loss SEC champion, they're getting in. I think there might even be an argument to be made that both of those SEC teams could get in if that were to play out. And obviously we have a while from where we are on Saturday until we get to early December and conference championship weekend. But I don't think it's a make or break playoff game. However, the team that wins, whew, the path is all ahead of you to the college football playoff. That game is going to be a fun one. We can say that for sure. We may not know how it'll break, but we can say it will be a fun one. So obviously, Ben, we don't want to restrict you to just these games. Uh, Any other value you're seeing on the board here for week number one? One game that really, really interests me, and I'm very excited to see how this plays out. A little bit more worrisome now, I guess you could say, is LSU and UCLA. Because the number was three and a half, got bet up to four and a half on LSU. Now after UCLA's performance last week against Hawaii, back down to three and a half. And LSU is dealing with a lot and obviously all the fallout of Hurricane Ida. And although they've been out and they've been traveling and they've been practicing in Houston in anticipation for this game, a lot of these guys are from the state of Louisiana and their hearts and their concerns, and rightfully so, are going to be with their friends and family back in the state of Louisiana. I still think Coach Ed Ogeron will have them ready 
for this game. And excuse me, as I have to give my go Tigers for Coach O as they get ready for this <laughs> game. But I think, Jim, when you look at this LSU team, they're a team I'm very high on this year to look not quite like they did in 2019, because that's an all-time college football team that obviously won the national championship. But they had to replace 16 starters from that team entering last year in 2020 and then got hit with opt-outs in a huge way. This year, they have 16 starters back in a team that I think has a lot more experience, especially defensively, because they were the worst passing defense in the country last year, the fourth worst total defense in the country last year, gave up 34.9 points per game. And when I looked this up, it was the worst amount of scoring defense in terms of allowing their opponents to score since 1952 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So the defense was abysmal, but they fired Bo Pelini. There's a new defensive coordinator in town in Baton Rouge, and they have two of the best cornerbacks you will see in the fact that they are paired together in a tandem, and Eli Ricks and Derek Stingley Jr., who are two All-Americans in their time, Stingley in 2019, Ricks last year in 2020, I think should give LSU fans a little bit more confidence in that this defense will be a lot better this year. And then offensively, I believe in Max Johnson. Yes, it was a smaller sample size in his freshman year last year, but eight touchdowns to only one interception. And I think that's huge for a freshman because even if there was upside there, if he's turning the ball over, you might have some questions. I think when you look at this LSU offense this year under the direction of Max Johnson, all five offensive linemen return as well. And then Kayshawn Butte, who's on the outside, one of the best wide receivers in the SEC, possibly the country, maybe the next great LSU wide receiver, I think LSU can be good. So I don't think it's that large of a number to back the Tigers. Yes, on the road. Yes, with other things outside of the football field that are certainly important. And yes, they are playing a UCLA team that whooped Hawaii 44 to 10 last week and ran all over the Rainbow Warriors. I still think it's a rather small number on a team that's ranked 16th in the country. And I expect to be even better than that ranking towards the end of the year. Yeah, if we're going to have faith in a, a program bouncing back, LSU seems like a good one to, to bet on with that with Ed O. That is Ben Stevens. Check him out on Twitter at Ben Scott Stevens. Make sure you check out the morning after on Sports Grid as well. Ben, we appreciate the time. Enjoy a full slate of Big Ten football this week, and hopefully we'll talk to you uh, once again here soon. I can't wait, guys. Thanks so much for having me on, Jim. Ed, pleasure to be with you guys talking college football. Thank you. Ben. Appreciate it. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Ben Stevens for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on week one of college football. And Ed, I think that the the approach of just finding your niche in college football is always going to be the optimal way to do things. We know people like Bud Elliott who can like just run through like 60,000 games at once. But Bud Elliott's brain is unique. Not everyone can do that. And I think that having a niche, whether it be a specific con conference, a specific market and stuff like that, it seems like if you're trying to optimize college football it does seem like that's the best way to do so yeah bill Connolly can also know 130 Correct. teams inside and out and also sound intelligent about fcs games as as well um yeah i don't know i'm not i'm kind of not capable of of doing that uh my my approach with college you know i mean I, I think you have to know these teams in order to bet a market as hard as nfl or college football and i i can't know 130 teams to the level that uh, I need to be able to bet 130 teams. So, yeah, I mean, last year I really focused on the Big Ten. Uh, I mean, if you look back at the episodes we did, I think a lot of the games that I talked about were were Big Ten games. I do intend to continue that this year. Uh, it obviously makes a lot of sense just living here in Ann Arbor, you know, one team check right away. Uh, also did a Big, Big, East, Big Ten East preview over on the preview series on the Football Analytics Show. But, yeah, no, you know, I didn't. I didn't find any of those Big Ten games that I really liked. Uh, I think those week one lines got beat beat into shape pretty well. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think you really do need to know the teams. And, and the more, the better. Um, so, yeah, that was a great approach and, and, and great appearance by Ben. Yeah, I mean, Ben's, Ben's great. That's why I wanted him on. Um, delight to talk to him. He's always fun on the morning after as well. So check out Ben on Sports Grid on the morning after and Ariel as well. Let's move into covering the future. And as you said, the Big Ten lines didn't show a lot of promising stuff for you. So you're going non-Big Ten for week one. What is standing out to you? Yeah, so I, I want to talk about a team from the ACC that, that I think has high upside. And when when you talk about teams with high upside, you know, how. Uh, one way you can kind of figure it out is look at all the teams that are not named Alabama that have won a national championship since Nick Saban won his first in 2009. So 2010, you have Auburn, 
Cam Newton was the quarterback. 2013, you have Florida State. Jameis Winston was the quarterback. 2014, Ohio State. Cardell Jones was the quarterback. 2016, Clemson. Deshaun Watson. 2018, uh, Clemson again. Trevor Lawrence. And then 2019, LSU and Joe Burrow. So uh, one of those kind of sticks out to you, right? A little bit. <laughs> yeah. So so Cardell Jones kind of kind of sticks out. All Just the rest of those guys. What? Just a slight bit. Yeah. Just a slight bit. Cardell Jones in his 11 career NFL pass attempts. But you'll notice all those other guys were the top pick in the NFL draft. And Deshaun Watson, a guy whose play has, has clearly said he, he was worthy to be the top pick um, as well. So you really need a lights out quarterback if you're going to challenge in the top end of college football. And Alabama is also following this script as well. Um, they're never going to try to they actually won a title with Jacob Coker at the quarterback position in 2015, but I, I don't see Nick Saban ch- trying that again. Obviously, the the quarterback quarterback play has been much better with Tua Tagovailoa and Mac Jones over the last couple of years, and that that offense and that program has really been changed. So you know, Nick Saban understands the importance of offense, but I really think that the top end of college football looks more and more like the NFL. And when you're handicapping those top games, like what matters? Well, the pass offense and uh, how you can cover in the secondary. And, you know, I'm not saying the other stuff doesn't matter and not to the extent that, you know, we can show that rushing almost has zero relationship to running in the NFL. But that's the direction in which, especially the top of college football is moving. Now, am I going to use that same, uh, am I going to use that that same type of logic to, to look at Penn State and Wisconsin in the Big Ten? No. But when you're looking at the top teams, um, I, I think it you are you are looking at pass offense and pass defense. So, what is a team that is going to do well in 2021? Well, I really like North Carolina. Sam Howe uh, is entering his uh, true junior season. He's been two starters there. Um, I really like his play. He's actually the favorite to be the top pick in the 2022 NFL Draft over on DraftKings right now. And, you know, their their offense has been really good in my adjusted passing success rate. They've been 10th and 16th over the last two years. Um, obviously, having the top pick in the NFL quarterback is not, excuse me, having the top pick in the next NFL draft of quarterback isn't enough. You can just ask Baker Mayfield and, and Kyler Murray about this. Uh, they never were able to get it done. You You have to have a pass defense. And that's also something that I find really interesting about North Carolina. They were 22nd when I look at pass defense by adjusted success rate. And that's pretty remarkable considering that three defensive backs opted out and um, one of their top corners, Storm Duck, didn't play after two games because of an injury. They get Storm Duck back. Uh, They got some great play out of Tony Grimes last year. It looks like they have the pieces on that side of the ball as well. There's uh, the defensive line is pretty strong and, and a bunch of highly talented guys. Uh, I've been recruited by Mac Brown. So I really like the prospects of North Carolina. Uh, I think they're a team with a pretty high ceiling. You can actually, uh, I bet them to win the ACC at 12 to one. Uh, I think that number is kind of absurd. Um, uh, you know, Clemson obviously is going to be the favorite. And I think that's, that's giving you pretty good return on North Carolina. And then even if North Carolina makes it through the championship game, there's, there's pretty good hedging opportunity there as well so i'm high on north carolina and sam how interested to see how they do against virginia tech starting friday night yeah that number is five and a half for unc versus virginia, virginia tech do you think that's a fair number or do you think that you could justify laying five and a half with unc Nah, it's not a fair number okay uh, so you want I, UNC I, I mean my number is like north carolina in that game and i think i think my numbers are underestimating north carolina okay that's the potential i think they have okay and sam howell is someone who like I, I put a lot of stock in like collegiate deficiency numbers because they do translate pretty well to the NFL in terms of uh, once you account for age and experience, but Howell checks those two boxes because he's already at uh, 25 total games played and his adjusted yards per attempt as a freshman when there were fans in the stands was 9.7. So you right. could write off 11.1 last year because there are no fans, pretty high scoring in general, but like he also did it as a true freshman. And I think that 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 matters a lot because he's entering, I think it's either his age 20 or age 21 season. And Mm -hmm. if you're looking for an NFL draft prospect, we talked about this with Trevor Lawrence during his freshman year. You want a guy who is young, experienced, and efficient. And Howell right now 
is checking all three boxes. So if you're looking for a quarterback who has the upside to be that first overall pick, he actually does fit in that mold very well. Burrow didn't, but like, you know, he's kind of the outlier. And yeah. I think that the overall mold is looking for successful guys is those checking those three boxes. And Howell right now does shape up pretty well for that. And I think that that makes him interesting if we're looking for upside as guys who could potentially do this. Now, I yeah. do want to bring up, though, you mentioned Tua. You mentioned uh, the Alabama quarterbacks, Mac Jones. No love for Greg McElroy, New York Jets legend, oh, yeah. I should say, Greg McElroy, uh, who, Ed, I will, I will let you know, is a winner in the NFL. He entered a game when the Jets were down 3 nothing against Arizona. Mark Sanchez got benched. Greg McElroy goes 5 of 7. Great completion percentage. Ignore the fact it was for 29 yards. <laughs> and led the Jets to a 7-6 to six victory. I mean, like, why are we ignoring Greg McElroy in this Alabama quarterback discussion? Uh, I, I feel like Greg McElroy is a great announcer. He I like is. hearing him call the games. Uh, I'm not going to comment too much about his abilities as a quarterback. Um, but we are forgetting one NFL quarterback. Um, AJ McCarron. What? Yeah, McCarron. McCarron. Yeah. McCarron was like the most underrated college football quarterback ever. Their numbers were phenomenal when he was there. He never really got too much respect. Uh, he was, I mean, a lot better than Jacob Coker. Um, so I believe he got cut for Felipe Franks and Josh Rosen this week in the NFL. So uh, well, we are we are glossing over him potentially for good reason. But either yeah, way, but he's yeah. had more than eleven career pass attempts. Right, this is so, very true. This, this Almost got good. traded for a second and third yeah. round pick at the trade deadline at one point too. So AJ McCarron, illustrious career. But Ed, yeah. we're talking Alabama quarterbacks. We might as well talk Mac Jones versus Tua Tungavailoa in week number one. That is my cover in the future, so perfect transition by you into that because I think this game is really fun. Pats just announced that Mac Jones will start this game, and it's probably a good thing because last year the, the Patriots ranked 27th in schedule-adjusted passing efficiency based on number fires metrics, and if you're going to have that level of efficiency, it's going to be tough to win a lot of games. If you put Mac Jones behind a very good offensive line and an improved group of pass catchers, I think they should take a step forward. I do think that they're overrated for week one, though. So I want to go with the Dolphins' money line at plus 116. I do have some improvement baked in for the Patriots in my numbers right now. They were 27th last year, as mentioned, in passing efficiency. I've got them 24th heading into this year. That may sound low, but I don't think it is because of the rookie quarterback starting in week one, I have Mac Jones as one of the best projected passing efficiency going in because of the offensive line and some other stuff. So it's less about Mac and more about the fact we don't often see rookie quarterbacks who light things up right out of the gate. The Patriots do get a lot of guys off it out last year. That could help them for sure. But they also open the year without Stephon Gilmore. Uh, their stud corner is going to open the year on the pup list. So he will miss the first six weeks. That's going to leave them shorthanded on defense. The Dolphins are also a bit shorthanded because Will Fuller will not play week one. He is suspended. They didn't have him in the preseason either, though. And Tua Tunga Vailoa, I thought, still looked pretty good there. He averaged a 0.28 uh, passing EPA per drop back in the preseason. That's according to NFL's next gen stats. I'm not changing my prior based on that, obviously, because it's preseason. He's playing against backups and stuff like that. But I think it's reassuring given that I, I've got some progression for this offense baked into my numbers. And that was that Will Fuller, Devontae Parker didn't play in the preseason either. And Parker should be good to go for week one. Miami enters this year ranked 15th in my power rankings. The Patriots are 21st. Not a big gap, especially with this game being in Foxborough, but it's enough where I do think that there is value in the Dolphins for week number one. I would be checking out their team total once that's available. That's not up at FanDuel Sportsbook right now, but... Once it's up, I'll probably have interest there given the Gilmore injury. But I think with where things stand now, I do like the Dolphins' money line at plus 116. Again, that's not an anti-Mac Jones thing. I think that he should be, for a rookie quarterback, pretty good this year. I think it's more so about the Gilmore injury being high in the Dolphins in general and just you know being wary of rookie quarterbacks as a general rule of thumb. And that's something you've talked about before, too, of being, I would say wary of rookie quarterbacks is that way to is that a fair way to phrase that for you oh yeah absolutely yeah no i'm, I'm definitely i mean I, I love mac jones i think he's got a ton of potential uh really love his pocket presence love his accuracy but he should struggle this year 
right? I mean, that's kind of the bottom line. And we talk a lot about the pass catchers, but like, there's a reason Nelson Aguilar was available. There's a reason that a lot of these guys were available. Kendrick Bourne. I mean, Johnu and Hunter Henry are fine, but like, you know, right? guys don't hit the open market if they are clear superstars. Uh, so they're better than what they had last year, and that's good. And I am, again, expecting them to be a lot better and expecting Mac to be the best rookie quarterback from a passing efficiency perspective due to that surrounding environment. But I still think it's it's fair to be a bit skeptical, whereas the Dolphins, I think, project to be a pretty good team for this year. So give me the Dolphins plus 116 in week number one. That is all that we have here for this week on covering the spread. But I am excited for next week. NFL week number one, just around the corner. You know we'll get you set for that next week. So make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us. And while you're there, leave us a rating and review as well. Big thank you once again to Ben Stevens. Find him on Twitter at Ben Scott Stevens. Check out the morning after on Sports Grid to find Ben and Ariel there. Thank you, Ben. Ed, what is going on for you this week over the Power Rank? Yeah, so I'm writing my email newsletter. Uh, so you can get that at thepowerrank.com. Um, more of, of my betting analytics, data-driven betting advice. I'm also really excited about the preview series that we've done over at the Football Analytics Show. I've been producing episodes. Edward Egros has been producing episodes. Uh, so there's uh, you know nine, ep- eight episodes up now. Uh, there will be ten. So these are about ten minutes each. Um, and you know the way it turned out this year, we really had a chance to dig into some um, analytics that you know potentially will give you an edge betting on things. Uh, so yeah, I think they're really good. Uh, Edward's episodes have been really awesome. So check that out, uh, the Football Analytics Show, wherever you get your podcasts. And again, don't forget the email newsletter as well at thepowerrank.com. Ed is on Twitter at thepowerrank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Enjoy the college football throughout this entire week. And also enjoy some NFL as we get set for week number one next week. We'll talk to you then. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Aaron Dolan here. Thanks for watching and make sure you click below on that subscribe button for more great FanDuel content and check out some of our latest uploads and playlists right over here.